Guten Abend und herzlich willkommen aus Berlin. Good evening and welcome from Berlin to the fifth and last but one um, series of our talks, development of the social democracy in Europe, 1917 to 2020. The sixth part series is organized and held by Willy Brandt Foundation in cooperation with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And I'd like to express our cordial thanks to Ebert Foundation, Anja Krug in Bonn and her team for the always excellent cooperation. I'd like to welcome very cordially our two guests, political scientist Sherry Berman from Barnett College at Columbia University, New York City. Welcome. And the political scientist Dr. Michael Zürn from the Berlin Center for Social Studies. And last but not least are today's host, Hans Monat, journalist from Berlin Tagesspiegel. He is responsible for all the reporting and articles uh, with a focus on social democracy and SPD. In the last months and weeks, we looked at the development of the social democracy in, um, in Europe. Today, we would like to look beyond the European horizon and ask how the social democratic and center-left parties developed in other parts of the world and what situation they are in today and whether the social democracy in a changing world order could gain more global attractiveness. With admiration and a bit of envy, the social democratic parties in Europe have been looking to New Zealand for a couple of years, where the Prime Minister Jasminda Ardern is leading a very successful social, part, social democratic party. And we look to the United States, where after Joe Biden came, to force uh, to power um, a clear social democratic development is visible. Before I hand over to Hans Monat, who will introduce to you our two guests and will chair the discussion, an advice or a remark to you, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to use the chat function to write down questions or use our Twitter account to ask questions to our panelists. And we'll answer your questions in the last part of our panel discussion. From the very beginning, our series started with a little um, series of articles, which is published uh, as a blog. My colleague, Bernd Rota, wrote the blog for today, and the two of us planned this series. You find all these articles on the website uh, of the Willy Brandt Foundation and FES History. I wish you all an interesting evening, and over to you, Hans Monat. Thank you very much, and good evening. We have an expert from the United States, and we have an expert from Germany here. They have one thing in common, both are experts uh, as regards the other side of the, the ocean, if I read your, your CVs correctly. Professor Sherry Berman is political scientist at the Dwanet College at New York in New York City. She's researching on European history and politics, on the development of uh, the democracy, populism, fascism, and the history of the left. She is a regular author of a publication which some of the audience will know, The International Politics and Society, published by Friedrich Ebert Foundation and the Journal of Democracy. Together with Hans Kunani, she, she published in January in that publication in the General, Journal of Democracy, a statement headlined mainstream parties in crisis, the cast of convergence. Professor Michael Cern is chairing the Department of Global Government at the, the Scientific Center for Social Studies in Berlin, BZB, and Professor for International Relations at the Free University. For three years, he has been the, the spokes men of a excellence cluster and the title tells you that the political 
force we are discussing today. Social democracy is coming up uh, to some no nose wind or even a storm. His, public, his book came out a couple of weeks ago, Democratic Regression um, and Authoritarian Populism. I think this is a publication we will um, touch this evening. My name is Hans Monat. I'm a political editor at Tagesspiegel. And Mrs. Meyer mentioned it. I've been observing the FAS for years. And if you allow, uh, at times, the, the observer turns depress or depressed on this. Let's come to a object of focus. Let's have a look at back into the golden age of social democracy in Europe, the 70s, before we look into the past, uh, into the present and the future. Golden age, why? In the north of Europe, the, the upcoming states set examples. There were also good examples in the southwest of Europe. Social democracy, social democracy helped to um, characterize the politics after the end of World War II. From 69 to 82, we had social democratic chancellors in Germany. There was an upcoming social democratic uh, society. But the representatives of the social democracy wanted more. They wanted to lead uh, the European uh, society out of um, poverty and conflict. Today, people are almost no more aware uh, what's common sense. Um, you know, the, the idea was completely new in the past. The Club of Ro Rome published a report, um, Restrictions of Growth in 1992, the North South report was published eight years later um, in 1980. The social democrats, when they look at the world outside of Europe and wanted to co were cooperating with the social international on social democratic concepts, they were they were van uh, they were in the vanguard of their time. My question to Sherry Berman and then afterwards to Michael Cern. The hopes of the social democrat social democrats were they justified to make their own policy to a worldwide model were there partners in other parts of the world that were able to develop this sherry berman please over to you um thank you and um thanks for asking me to participate in this conversation so i think what um what you pointed to is correct that is to say that we can look at the post-war decades as a kind of golden age for social democracy and that golden age refers, I would say, not even primarily to its electoral success, although obviously parties of that name were much more successful during those decades than they've been for the last several decades, but simply because the kind of um, worldview, the Weltanschauung that was um, associated with social democracy really was triumphant in the post-war years. That is to say, a view that um, insisted that it was the job of governments to control capitalism and to control markets, to um to use the power of the state to ensure that um no one's life chances were completely determined by their place in the market that some social goals um social stability a degree of social unity um not allowing inequality to rise dramatically that these were goals that were um not only important for governments to focus on but that if necessary, again, restraining markets in order to achieve these goals was absolutely necessary. And of course, this was the lesson of the Great Depression and the collapse of democracy that happened during the interwar years, right? The idea accepted, again, not just by social democratic parties, but by parties of the center right after 1945 was that the world had to change if it was to be made safe for democracy. We could not allow the social instability, the economic crises, um, that had plagued Europe and other parts of the world during the interwar years to remain. So, you know, that really is the era of social democracy because that view of the correct relationship between states and markets really was the dominant one. And again, I would say not just on the center left, but even stretching to the center right as well.
Soll ich einfach eingreifen? Okay, shall I take over? Feel free, thank you. Yes, I think talking about the 70s of the last century, we are talking about a golden age of the social democracy, even as a golden age of the democratic intervention and intervention state in general. This is the social democratic model Sherry Berman mentioned. Two preconditions are decisive, I think. One is the um, election success, and uh, this rested on three conditions which were given then. Uh, today, only post partially. One is that there was a big group of industrial workers, which were up to 40% of the working population. Secondly, there was a a compatibility of interests of these industrial workers with the public sector. And number three, these two groups um, were the majority, formed the majority together. And these three factors are different today. We have a much smaller group of industrial workers. We have contradicting interests of a uh, cosmopolitical resistance and um, a working class, and therefore a, a lower compatibility of this coalition, so to say. The second point, and I think this is the decisive point here in this context, there was a compatibility of the politics of those social democratic policies with the world order, a world order which you could call an embedded um, multinationalism, which created the space for a principally open world trade order, an embeddedness thanks to national welfare programs by the construction of the national welfare state. This compatibility got lost. But the decisive point is this program was no national program. There was no, or it was a national program. There was no cooperation between the social democratic governments required. And therefore, you know, the Brandt report and things you mentioned before, um, and Club of Rome, if you want to add this to social democratic measures. So there was no necessity of cooperation between social democratic parties and a social in order to get the social democratic order uh, was not necessary. Uh, all this was based on the national welfare state. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with um, with Michael's comments about some of the preconditions. I might add a couple of others, which I think are not different, but are slightly different ways of interpreting it, which I think provide a good link to the problems that social democracy has had in the last couple of decades. And that is that during this golden era, during these post-war decades, two related kinds of things were in play as far as politics were concerned. One was that the primary interest that most voters brought to the political sphere was an economic interest or a class identity, right? When you look at how people voted during that period, um, the best predictor you had was their socioeconomic status. And so when people thought of themselves, particularly obviously social democratic voters, they thought of themselves in terms of class. I'm a worker, I vote social democratic. Um, and related to this, again, the primary issues around which political competition pivoted were economic issues. Um, how big should the role of the state be? Um, how much should we spend on social policy? Um, things of that nature. And if you look at what happened over the past several decades, both of those things, which I would say are preconditions for social democratic success, not just at the electoral level, but at the sort of ideological level, um, that is to say at the level of determining what kind of model dominates our political economies, those have disappeared, right? Or they have attenuated greatly. And this started happening 
in the 1970s. Now, as Michael pointed out, right, there's a lot of things associated with this. The, the nature of international capitalism changed um, so that it was not any longer as compatible with national-based Keynesian welfare state, um, state control over certain kinds of market functions, things like that. But thinking about, again, how voters see themselves, the identities and the interests that they bring to um, the political sphere and the kinds of issues that politics pivots around, I think are very important for understanding, again, not just how democratic politics in the West has changed over the past decades, but why social democracy's fortunes at an electoral level and even at a broader ideological level have declined over that period as well. Um, when the when the regulation of the market by the state on national level worked, uh, the supply of social security also, and uh, how could social democrats hope that this model could be accepted in countries that had different preconditions, maybe not such a developed economy, as it was probably in uh, Central Europe in the 70s. Was this a well-meant error or at that time, the uh, we, we had to look at the options people had at that time and not in hindsight be more clever. Was it at that time reasonable to hope that uh, in other parts of the world this model could also be accepted where their partners, I don't know who of you would like to answer this question. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I'd ask the question here, is it really a fact that the most well-known social democratic politicians at that time, apart from Brand Palm and Kreisky, that they really had the idea that global, the global south could turn social democratic overnight. I am not that sure. Sure, there was the model that Southern Europe could follow and there were good uh, approaches from the perspective of that time. But the point is a report that pointed to the fact that we need to support um, countries in the third world much more because we do have a high level of in the interdependency and we need to pay attention uh, that there is no more exploitation because everything is embedded in an economic dimension. This is what I would see the brand report, not as the hope that if you just um, uh, have a well-meant model that African countries, for instance, jump to the social democratic way. There was this hope in Southern Europe and uh, partly in Southern America, but that is it. The other things were at that time, even by Willy Brandt and Palm and others thought asymmetric model, how could the North support or assist the South in a still paternalistic modus. Yeah, this um, enables me to correct this thing. I didn't want to present it as uh, um, an achievement, social democratic achievement. It's just um, an example of in the dependence and we are at a different level now. And that's why I uh, compared it to the North-South report. Thanks for this hint. Uh, Ms. Berman, this model of social democracy in the 70s of the last century, did it shine or influence the United States? Was it uh, discussed at the time, if I'm not mistaken? The unions in the United States were much stronger than they are today. Was this uh, acceptable in the United States or was there a debate? They are starting anew and we need to embrace other parts of the world. Can we learn something or wear own American tradition much, much stronger? 
So we've never had, of course, uh, a really strong indigenous social democratic party or tradition in the United States. The American Democratic Party, which is our center left party, has always been um, more centrist than its labor and social democratic counterparts in Europe. There's a variety of reasons for that, obviously different American history, two party system, that sort of thing. Now there were various times in American history and the sixties um, would be one of them when you know a lot of things were up for grabs. Um, in the 1960s, both on the level of racial relations and on the level of um, economics, there was an opening for change. Um, and a lot of people link the two, that is to say the need for racial justice needed to go hand in hand with um, significant economic reforms. I mean, in retrospect, we got more done on the racial front, however inadequate, um, than we did on the economic front. Um, and since the 1970s, the United States was pretty much stuck in this kind of, again, much more centrist type of mode rather than pushing towards a more social democratic position. And, you know, obviously Europeans look at the United States and wonder how um, we get by without things like universal health care, having to pay extraordinary amounts for college um, and levels of education and all these kinds of things. So it's really only in the last year or two, right, um, in the run up to the 2020 election, that actual reforms that would push the United States significantly to the left on economic questions became really a uh, political possibility. So really the Biden administration and the kinds of things that um, Biden says he wants to do is really the first time with the possible exception of Obama's attempt to expand access to healthcare that we've had a really significant opening on the economic front. But it's important to note that even the reforms that Biden wants would only sort of approximate on some very, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of minor level in many ways, a lot of things that Europeans have taken for granted since the post-war period. Darf ich da noch, noch einen Punkt ergänzen? Yeah. I add one point here. Of course, I would like to underline this too, but also add that uh, Jacinda Ardern, Joe Biden and others to an extent uh, have an advantage. They are at this level between market and state and they are free to act. Uh, apart from social cultural questions and never have to wonder what is a social democratic tradition. And social democracy here is also social democratic history and tradition that this European social democracy needs to be sought in a way. Is this politics um, possible to reconcile with the history of the labor movement and social ideas and the ideas of material equality. These are elements that for me are co-constitutive with social democratic parties and this differentiates European social democratic parties from the left or center left parties in the United States or New Zealand. That's a fantastic uh, story, but uh, to a certain extent, it is a burden because certain measures cannot be done because you have to ask the question whether they are in uh, the um, level of the uh, classical social democratic clientele. Ms. Berman, you said uh, to a lesser extent, this is social democratic, what Biden is doing, a um, package of $1.8 billion, strengthening families, paternity money, which should be refinanced by tax increases for uh, will of people. And it was said here, Biden's plan is the attempt a 
of a large-scale social democratization to reach a level which is already the standard in other countries. Is this, um, um, well, idea like some arrogance in Germany? We had the New Deal of Ruth's world, similar elements containing. Is this German arrogance? to pass such uh, judgment or? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, one thing to remember though, is that you know Biden still has to pass a lot of these policies through a Congress that um, is not um, exactly eager to um, pass all of these policies, right? I mean, some of them he can get through what we call reconciliation, but you know we have this kind of crazy system now in the United States where in order to actually pass policies, it has to get through a 60% hurdle in the Senate. And the Republican Party now is very unwilling to support anything that is put forward by a Democratic president. But, you know, even if we assume that Biden got everything that he wanted, yes, the spending is massive, the deficits accordingly so. Um, the desire to put in place something like a child care allowance, the desire to expand, although not universalize, I should point out, health care, um, you know, these are important changes. They will not push the United States past where Europe is. And as I said previously, they would really barely approximate some of the things that, you know, many of the things that Europeans have taken for granted. But yes, this would be a significant change should um, these policies pass. The social safety net will expand probably um, in a, to a greater degree than if not since the 1960s, probably since, as you mentioned, um, you know, sort of the New Deal. So yes, depending on what Biden can do, we might see something very significant change in American political economy. Getting back to what Michael said, though, you know, I, I think that there's plus and minuses to the sort of Biden, um, you know, sort of Jacinda Aldern, you know, New Zealand model. Yes, these are not parties with strong social democratic traditions. And on the one hand, yes, it frees them, as you said, from having to ask questions about, you know, is this consistent? Is this not consistent? Yada, yada. But the very lack of that tradition, I think, is also to some degree a weakness. It's a weakness because many of the, much of the success is dependent on the particular politician in charge, right? Biden won an election. He was the right man for the right time. Jacinda Aldern is a sort of young, charismatic politician. Without a sort of ideology and a party strongly behind you, you know, those policies become very fragile. They become very fragile to change in personnel. They become very fragile to change in context. They become very fragile to changes in voter priorities. The advantage of having a social democratic mindset or tradition embedded in society is that it gives your policies staying power, right? It makes them part of what people expect. It makes them, um, you know, part of what parties are identified by. And so, you know, we have to think about, you know, what happens when that social democratic tradition um, disappears or doesn't exist. Because again, what you tend to get in those kinds of situations is much greater policy fluctuations, right? If Biden should lose, for instance, if the Democrats should lose in the midterms, which historically they probably will, and will no longer have a majority in perhaps either house of Congress, you can expect that absolutely nothing, nothing will get done. Um, and so, you know, you have to think very carefully about, you know, what happens when parties become very dependent on specific circumstances and specific politicians in order to get things done. Biden's success was made possible because he, with the politics of his democratic uh, predecessor, Hillary Clinton, he broke with this because she tried to establish a rainbow community of minorities, sort of, and uh, part of the white blue collar workers did not find themselves uh, represented. And uh, she was talking about basket of deplorables, uh, people uh, to be called deplorables and this was printed 
by Trump uh, voters on their T-shirts and they were proud. Uh, if we attacked like that, we give it back. So my question is, did not did Biden not realize and try to win back this classical voters, which could be called social democratic voters? And couldn't he, in this respect, social democrats, couldn't they learn something from him? I don't know how you see this. There is this classical separation as uh, Wolfgang Merkel does between cosmopoliticians and the communitarists and uh, due to his opinion, SPD makes the mistake that they overwhelmingly listen to the cosmopoliticians and the uh, others are not that flexible and they do not feel represented. And uh, should uh, social democracy listen to both? They should definitely listen to Biden. I find it important, the point of Sherry Berman, um, to say that in New Zealand, in the United States, to a considerable extent, we have situation related, uh, situative success. This is something else than the latest trend in the 70s. The, the co comrade trend needs a constellation, an ideology, a program which is able to win over the majority of a society for long term. And this coalition comprises also, from a social democratic point of view, those who are bound to industrial jobs who do not have the qualification to um, survive in the mobile world and who have maybe traditional cultural values. I mean, my impression is that Biden won votes compared to Hillary Clinton on the material part, um, whereby he made the impression that he is the better choice to Donald Trump. I don't know whether he won so many votes from the so-called deplorables, but in so far, he won back a major part of the traditional working class. And this is quite a reason for this um, not really small shift compared to Hillary Clinton regarding number of votes. We always say pretended such a big difference. Uh, yes, but in absolute figures, it's a relative difference, this shift. But the decisive point for me uh, com uh, is in these two regards, that a prospect which is decisive for the democratic, for the social democrats in the age of globalization and internationalization as a social democrat, you cannot say, yes, I'm in favor of an international order, but I, I'm against open markets. You know, this tension, permanent tension over the last 20 years, which was always a conflict for the social democrats to transform this in a positive social democratic program to save global markets on the international level. And this is something really impressive that this is coming from a American from, from an American president with a corporate tax on a certain level. Why is it that no social democratic party in Europe simply demanded that we we will have just 10% poverty level compared to 3% the other level, uh, a, a balance on an international level, which tries to use the open international order for your own national purposes. And this is the tension tearing apart social democracy on the one hand, um, social democratic working class on the other hand, um, voters which are open and central and uh, cosmopolit com cosmopoliticians, this split which is tearing the social democrats apart. And this can be cleanly analyzed. So the point is 
that social democrats find coalitions where you try to create international framework conditions which make social democratic life easier in national states question regarding the regulation of the international financial markets or the international tax practice the social democrats when i'm looking at the german ones always insisted here but this will only be possible by the movement of the most important partner united states who will do or want to do this now or is offering this is this a question of social democratic practice or is it so to say simply a window of opportunity you will have to use oh, do i see this right corporate tax is a window of opportunity um a passing by opening of uh, patent rights for instance uh, regarding corona medication I mean, the fact that the social democratic finance minister in Europe would have stood up by a wish for strict regulation or uh, power in the European market is nothing I have ever seen, I must say. As this is the smaller part of the politics in Europe, but as in regard of tax policy, question of household policy, debt policy, here the social, the social democratic policy in Germany is very, very strong under a, a liberal consensus where they followed. And I mean, it's just rhetoric to say it is nice would be nice, but they behave differently on the European level. So this has never been a passionate project. That's what I mean. What I mean is it must be turned into the program of the party, not just waiting for an opportunity and hope that the others will come up with the proposal. As soon as it becomes the program, the, the old um, coalition of um, progressive center of the society and working class can be reunited. Okay, and let me come back to the question. You, you mentioned it. What enables the, the union between classical workers, which are a small number, or uh, people with a, with a bad qualification who are not mobile, who are not benefiting or not benefit, maybe benefiting from uh, the opening of borders for goods, but not for capital, or who even feel threatened by this, who are not really the winners of the globalization. You mentioned these projects. People can see they do something for us. They protect us. They do not enable uh, capital flight in, in a way as it is happening now. But what else belongs to this? Uh, Sherry Berman. There are some common challenges um, on both sides of the Atlantic that your question and Michael's comments point to, and, and they're connected, right? One is, what is the correct social democratic program for the contemporary era? And the other is how to rebuild a coalition, an electoral coalition that allows social Democrats or the Democratic Party to you know, win elections. Um, and this this challenge about how to reconcile the two obvious constituencies for center left parties, right? Working class voters and progressive middle, upper middle class, highly educated voters, right? Um, you know, it, the, the, the manifestation of this is slightly different in Europe because um, that latter group, the highly educated progressive um, cosmopolitan voters, they have a choice, right, that they don't have in the United States. That is to say they can vote for green or new left parties, which is, you know, sort of what happens in Germany, right? Now, working class voters, right, in the United States and in Europe, now to a large degree vote not left, but for the functional equivalent of the populist right. Um, and this is a trend, by the way, that started in both um, you know, both Europe and the United States beginning in the late 1970s, we began to see at that point, working class, low educated voters begin defecting from center left parties, some of them just dropped out of the um, voting, um, voting block, they just 
stop voting. Others began to move around to other parties. But these days, um, if you look at right wing populist parties in Europe, Germany is a little odd here um, for a variety of historical reasons. But right wing populist parties are to a very large degree working class parties. And of course, in the United States, Donald Trump's you know, coalition had a large number of obviously white working class voters. And as mentioned um, a couple of questions ago, Biden's win was very much dependent on being able to lure back a small number of those voters. They still remain over 40% um, white, low educated, um, working class type voters. That's still about 40 plus percent of the electorate in the United States. And his ability to win back just enough of those voters, particularly in key states, was absolutely central to his victory. And it's very hard for me to see how in Europe, social democratic and labor parties can hope to, if not win elections, at least be big enough to dominate coalitions without a significant number of those voters. This is obviously a conversation that went on after the last um, by-election in Britain, right, with the Labour Party getting slaughtered in some of its traditional um, its traditional seats. The SPD in Germany now is polling at around 15%, having lost many of its progressive, highly educated voters to the Greens and many working class voters to other parties. Figuring out how to bring this coalition back together is crucial. One thing I can say is that it's not going to be done as long as non-economic issues dominate the political agenda. Why? Because these two groups have very different views on these issues. Low educated, working class voters tend to be moderate to conservative on social and cultural issues, you know, that cosmopolitan communitarian divide. Whereas obviously folks like, I'm guessing most of the people listening to this um, seminar tend to be quite cosmopolitan or to the left. And if people are voting on these issues, center left parties are just, they're going to die. They're going to get killed because they're just not going to be able to keep those groups together. The only possible way for those groups to come together, or at least enough of them to come together, is if the things that they are voting on, if the issues that dominate political competition are economic issues, and if social democratic parties, again, here getting back to what Michael said, have distinctive, passionate, exciting economic programs that these various groups can rally around. Ways to reshape both the domestic and the international economy in ways that promise to benefit the vast majority of citizens, right? If, if social democratic parties don't have that and can't make that something that's at the forefront of people's minds when they go into the voting booth, it's very hard for me to imagine how even possibly you're going to bring enough of those different kinds of voters together to get a viable winning electoral coalition. In in Germany, Mr. Cern, there is a special problem, this long term of the Great Coalition, which in the eyes of many voters led to a situation where the, the people's parties, if you may call them people's parties, are no longer seen as different, really different. Do you see that the concentration of economic questions is a chance for the social democracy to make their own way because the Christian Democratic Union is more skeptical towards regulation in these areas? There are weakening um, occurrences, but in fact, they are, um, you know, when we talk about um, that. Uh, policy, investment policy, the union is, is quite uh, shy here. Is this a chance? Yes, it is a chance, as it was described. I mean, talking about the two dimensions of the political uh, situation, you know, the state cultural openness versus nationalist orientation, you, you see that in Germany and in Western Europe in general, in voting systems, which are a proportion related um, voting systems, that you see a permanent growth on both sides for the Greens and in, in Europe. Both parts 
are getting stronger. And not only because the cultural questions are more important than the economic questions, but because these two parties who uh, are on, on that axis um, are very different, while the two parties on the other axis are not clearly differentiable in economic terms. And I think this is the chance uh, which uh, Sherry pointed out that resulting from this, such a repositioning, a re-regulation of the European and in general international markets, a differentiation on the part of economy will come up. And secondly, and we shouldn't forget this, it is not just program related, but it has an effect. Once they were implemented, uh, it uh, social democratic policy will make it possible on the, the national level with, without uh, the, the giants paying tax, the welfare state will not uh, be affordable. And therefore, international ways must be found in order to uh, make the digital giants pay tax. Because this is a, a clearly social democratic party. Let me add one more sentence. In this case, I think, uh, to, to add on Sherry's points, indeed, because maybe the European or, so, or German social democrats find it easier because of this story. Um, as a matter of fact, the established and well-employed German industrial worker uh, has uh, some or shows uh, some tendency towards authoritarian uh, populism. This is a matter of fact. It is not so much the traditional working class, especially not in regions where you have successful big, big industrial companies in Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg in the south of Germany, in the rich regions, there are not so many uh, populists or strong populists. A part of North Rhine-Westphalia is the region which, where the authoritarian uh, populists don't win the majority. Or it is not so characteristic for those regions. Okay, I see we have three quarters of our time uh, was used up. And therefore, let me ask Christina Meyer whether we should bring in the audience for questions. Did they send us questions? And uh, do you want to bring them in? Unfortunately, there aren't any questions in the live chat yet, but I'd like to take the chance or opportunity to ask Christian myself to add on what uh, Mr. Cern just said. I dealt with this topic um, of AFD and SPD. What does the AFD do in order to lure voters from the SPD when we watch this phenomenon phenomenon it, mostly in the, uh, in the north rhine uh, westphalia and there are social democrats that defected to the afd and where the afd um, succeeded to win over unsatisfied decades-long spd voters and this is not the only problem probably facing the SPD uh, when losing voters to other parties, but they lose in a certain clientele to AFD. My question now <laughs> directs into a completely different direction, the other parts of the world. Uh, Mr. Tsun, you talked about uh, New Zealand and Jacinda Ardern and uh, mentioned tradition tradition which might not play such a big part outside Europe in the center-left parties as it does here in Europe. Um, 
nevertheless, there is a Labour Party with a tradition in New Zealand. It's not a new party. So that's why I'd like to ask you, what does explain this phenomenal success by Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand? Is it not maybe the insular position or that the country in many respects can um, regulate certain things for itself because it's far away from others. It's uh, all in all a very progressive, peaceful society. I, I, I live there. How do we explain this success and what can we learn from that? Sherry Berman. Maybe Sherry Berman, you could. Well, look, I'm not sh I'm not sure how much can be learned from the New Zealand case other than that in an era when people's voting choices are quite fluid. Right. You know, so if you looked back at the 50s and 60s and 70s in Europe in particular, right, voting patterns were pretty stable. Um, people tended to vote for the same party over and over again. In a time when voters' choices are more fluid, a charismatic, attractive politician is a particularly big asset for a party. And Jacinda Aldrin is precisely that. She's young. She is charismatic. She is an attractive person who seems to, again, be sort of, you know, something of a fresh face and an outsider. And, you know, as far as COVID goes, um, you know, New Zealand's um, relatively, I mean, not relatively, very isolated position also helped, right, so that the COVID story there was quite mild, and that certainly added to her popularity. So look, I think you can always learn from other cases. Um, you know, and the other thing to note about New Zealand is New Zealand actually started that neoliberal turn um, earlier and in a more severe way than a lot of other countries. And so, you know, a sort of pullback from that perhaps was also, you know, sort of one of the underlying trends that ended up, you know, um, supporting the Labour Party somewhat indirectly. But, um, but, you know, look, you know, she has been, again, a charismatic popular leader who has certainly pulled her country to the left. I think one thing perhaps that we can say more generally is there is no major decline in support for what might very broadly be considered left economic policy, right? Even in the United States, for example, um, you know, if you poll people, if you ask them what they prefer without labels, generally there's a lot of sympathy for things like a strong social safety net, um, you know, support for parents, um, support for healthcare, all these kinds of things, right? So social Democrats are not suffering from the fact that people have turned right wing in their economic preferences. That's not really the issue there. The issue is, you know, sort of, again, as I mentioned before, how to get them to vote on those preferences and how to get social democracy back to a place where it has an attractive, viable and distinct economic program. Um, you know, left wing economic preferences are, are, have not disappeared. That's not that's not really the problem. Um, but the problem is getting people to, again, focus on economic issues and economic interests and making sure that when they do, it's social democratic parties that they think of as most likely to achieve the kind of economic goals that um, you know, they want their societies to achieve. Yeah. Um, well, I do think that we do have uh, certain accidental things depending on personalities. If we start or base ourselves thinking that the German political society is not that untypical, we do have a two-dimensional room or space that is 25% uh, of the people vote left, new left, new cosmopolitans, 25%, the authoritarian right, 25%, and 25% economic right wingers, and then 25% uh, Christian Democrats plus 5% liberals. We have the same constellation in uh, Germany and the old left with 25%. If due to historical conditions, the voting system or electoral system like in the USA 
it's possible to reduce this to one dimension. What Trump finally did to reconcile the old right with the new right, the a similar thing happened in New Zealand towards a historical and cultural background with this charismatic uh, person. We realized to get the new and the old left together because it's uh, always an accidental reconciliation of 25 percentages this is a relative instable story and which is prone to fluctuation I don't know whether it's 25% authoritarian rights. These are East German, well, uh, stories. Yeah, okay. Economic right, 25% plus the authoritarian right, maybe less than 25%. If uh, Ms. Meyer does not have any other question, okay, I'm handing back to you. I'd like to look into the future. How optimistic are both of you that the world in 10 or 20 years' time will be a social democratic one, more social democratic one than today. We do have one big uh, challenge uh, that was not yet mentioned, China, uh, that uh, it does not work on social democratic concepts, there is a more dictatorial development and impressive economic power and all hopes where the dissipation of welfare or would um, produce a, a, a bourgeois layer or stratus in um, society. It's no longer there if you have a closer look. We expect a division of the world, the fight of the United States against China, where Europe needs to find a position, whether they want to support one side or follow one's own way. But in this constellation, where is there any space or room for social democracy and how successful can it be? Who would like to start? of the two of you. What are your forecasts, your prophecies? I don't dare to forecast anything. Social scientists, no, no, that's like uh, um, throwing some darts. I would like to forecast that uh, this is not going to return. The task of social democracy needs to be to be as strong on its own that in coalition with other political forces, they can be or um, provide a new democratization of our societies. And this requires to supply an economy uh, which accord a larger um, part to institutions of the state. But this won't happen on a social democratic leader or party leader who will then probably have 40, 50 percent uh, in the chancellor. The social democratic area of the 70s of the last century was a an era of the social democratic national state who's got social democratic values needs to think differently and these political constellations are where the social democrats are an impressive weight but they will not have a social democratic hegemony. Berman. And Sherry Berman, what do you? Well, it's hard for me to imagine stable, well-functioning democracies without a degree of social democracy. And, and, and in that sense, I don't necessarily mean dominant 
social democratic parties. I refer here again to that sort of mindset or Welt and Schauung that we discussed earlier, right? Which is, you know, if societies are torn apart by economic divisions, by deep inequalities, by deep geographic divides, it's very hard to imagine how you can get, you know, sort of social stability and well-functioning democracy. So insofar as that recognition remains crucial, um, you know, that sort of social democratic insight or perspective, I think, is absolutely necessary. The question in Europe, of course, is whether that can be recreated, um, you know, with uh, uh, by a coalition of, in Germany, for instance, green parties and social democratic and perhaps the left party. I mean, there's not really, you know, the, the Christian Democrats have moved so far to the center on economics under Merkel that, again, you know, as was mentioned earlier, the differences economically are not that great. Um, you know, in the United States, really the key thing is, is Biden going to be successful? Because, um, you know, whether he is or not has really powerful implications for the success or the future of American democracy. And without a strong United States, one that is committed to um, a certain type of international order and to democratic progress, it's very hard for me to see how, you know, China can be successfully dealt with, um, try to make to be a player that contributes to a positive rather than a zero sum kind of international order. Um, so, you know, look, it's hard for me, really hard for me to imagine how the world um, goes forward in a progressive direction without a strong left, without strong support for, again, this kind of social democratic relationship between state and markets. And again, maybe because I'm American, um, but I really think the, the direction that the United States takes over the next three and a half and more years is gonna be really crucial because without the United States that's a stable, attractive, democracy, it's going to be much harder, not only to keep together an international coalition, but again, to fight back some of the very, very, very problematic tendencies coming from China and Russia today. So I'm cautiously optimistic, and I'm cautiously optimistic that the, the general social democratic view of the world retains a significant amount of support among sensible people um, who want to see the kind of social and political stability um, that's necessary for progress everywhere. Wenn man das zusammennimmt, was Sherry und ich gesagt haben, dann kommt man... When we combine what Sherry and I said, then we are faced with a tremendous task of um, a liberal international order that requires strong left forces and the strong left forces depend on the strong liberal international order. And this is the interdependence of these two sides. And in as much as that is concerned, the last 20 years were quite uh, difficult because on both parts, uh, things were lost. But there is hope, uh, the more when it comes to the interdependence. You both agreed in your analysis, if I'm not mistaken, that there is a need and an approval of social democratic contents. And when looking at the future, a social democratic historian Bick said about the project in the West, the project is much more smart than the protagonists, and we hope that the social democratic project will be smarter than the proponents. I thank both of you for your contributions. I learned a lot from them. And uh, Ms. Meyer is going to tell of how we are going to proceed. I don't know what is going to happen to the SPD, but to the series. I'd like to thank all of you, Cherry Berman, Michael Zun and Hans Monat for this thrilling discussion with a mixed outcome. But I don't believe that uh, the series before would have been more optimistic in the outcomes. An important um, note, for you, the audience, the sixth and last part was announced actually for the 
to the 17th June, but is uh, earlier now, 14th June, 18 o'clock. The historian Christina Maria is going to draw conclusions. And afterwards, with Herfried Münkler and Bernd Rote, will there will be a discussion of the future perspectives of social democracy. So Bertus Heil, unfortunately, had to uh, draw back. We'd like to uh, welcome you back here in this channel. I wish all of you in Berlin, New York, wherever you might be, a nice evening and thank you very much. Cheers. Goodbye. Yeah.